Can you believe it's been 15 years since we first posted on YouTube? No, absolutely not. It seems like yesterday. It really does. We're going to be talking today about our little journey on YouTube, how we got started, what we learned, and how we became accidental YouTubers. Yeah, and let me say, we're going to depart a lot of wisdom because it takes a lot to do something for 15 years. Like, this isn't you had one big video go viral. This is like maintaining a household, having a career, like raising a child. Like, this has been a career for us. Yeah, we've made a lot of mistakes, too. I think we can impart quite a bit of wisdom. But first, a word from our sponsor, Squarespace, whether you need your own website, portfolio, a store to sell your photos or whatever else you may be selling, you can make it happen at Squarespace. And if you want to just try it out, you can do it for free with a 14-day trial. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. And when you decide to go live, use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. You got to spell it correctly. I think you said Squarespace has been our sponsor for seven years now, right? Um, seven or eight years. Yeah, they, and, they built this studio. Yes, we used our first checks from them to build out the studio. And the first couple of years of checks. Yeah, and I'll never forget, I pulled their email from Ilias Frankel. If you're out there, thank you. <laughs> I pulled it out of the spam box in our YouTube messages, which we weren't even really checking. And we were like, is this, I was like, is this real? What is Squarespace? And I remember looking it up and Elias seemed like a cool guy and now it's been eight years and... Yeah, thanks Squarespace. They've been a really key part of making all of this happen. So let's talk about the beginning of our journeys. Yeah, because you As photographers were... and as creators. Yeah, well, you were first to post on YouTube. In January of 2007, you posted your very first YouTube video, which was about, like, I honestly looked at it and I still don't know what it is. It's about computers. I don't know. Yeah, and the quality is very bad in every way. But this was so long ago that digital video cameras weren't really a thing at all. We had, yeah. I had a webcam and I could record a screencast. And at the time, I had public, I'd written like 25 computer books. Yeah. some massive number of computer books. But I kept thinking, there's so much potential in this idea of d internet video that for, for education purposes. This has to be the next way to teach people. And so I wanted to figure out how to be on camera. And that, that's what I was doing. I was just experimenting with it. And it's terrible because everybody's <laughs> first steps have to be terrible, right? Because nobody starts out as an expert in anything. Yeah, you were pretty early though because YouTube came out February 2005. You were January 2007. And then I, this was before we met. I put out my first video in 2008. And mine was also, now that you mentioned it, mine was filmed with a webcam too. Or maybe it was like my computer camera propped up. Mm -hmm. And I was singing a like John Mayer song because I was a piano teacher before this. So I was really into music. And then I never posted anything again. I continue to dabble with it. And some of my old computer videos actually had some views. Yeah, I saw and that. If you notice, our channel name is Vista Clues, or is it Vista Clues? Uh, because I was making videos about Windows Vista. Whoa, that aged time. well. But I accumulated 5,000 <laughs> subscribers. Yeah. And we didn't want to start a new YouTube channel and give up those 5,000 subs because we thought that was such a like significant number. We needed to really leverage that. That's, and that's a why lot. we kept up with this single channel the whole time. Yeah, you posted like 30 computer videos and then. Um, that just kind of went dormant for a while. And then we started writing. Then we met in 2008. Yeah. And then we started writing stunning digital photography. And that's our photography book. And I still had the same idea in my head where I thought, I've been making a living off of writing a book. I wrote my first book when I was 22. <laughs> educational yeah. book. Yeah. And that's how I made my living. But I thought, this is going away. Because I'd been in this tech field and I kept seeing career after career just disappear. I knew I was just like one of those penguins jumping from one iceberg to the, to the next. And my current iceberg of educational books was going to float off into the ocean. So I had to get on to the next thing. I had to figure out video. But you were also doing photography because you had started your own stock site kind of accidentally. And you were taking animal pictures and putting them on, uh, on the internet. And then people were searching for like a tiger and Tony's picture would come up. And then I remember people would send you little messages like, I, can I use your tiger picture for my school report or for yeah. my college paper? And, and then Google Images came along and totally destroyed that website. Yeah, so I was always obsessive about wildlife. I, I 
took and categorized over a thousand species of animals on Northrop.org, which isn't around anymore, but you could look it up on the Wayback Machine. And I was getting hundreds of thousands of views a month just running off of this server in my basement. And I would sell pictures for like $5. Yeah. <laughs> but then Google Ads came along, and suddenly I was making like $40,000 a year, like more than most people made on their full-time job just from running on these Google Ads. And so that's why I thought, oh, I should invest in better camera gear. I am now a professional photographer, essentially, and just continued put more, to put more effort into wildlife photography. And that's kind of what brought my own journey to wildlife photography, especially, and to eventually writing stunning digital photography, is finding a way to make money at it. And I think that's a, a key lesson here is on YouTube, in photography, it's great to be passionate about something and pursue it for free, but you can't do something full time for if free. you're doing it for free. Yeah. So if you find something that you love, you kind of have to figure out how to make money at it to be able to pay the bills. And so it just happened to line up that my wildlife photography was able to pay the bills. Speaking of passions that do not pay the bills, I was teaching piano lessons and making <laughs> $12,000 a year, which in the United States means you're starving. I was yeah. like not doing well. And also kids kept taking off in the summers. Like I was crying every summer, like adding up how much I was going to make. And you had Northrop.org and you were trying to hire people to write for your website. And I was like, man, I know we're just dating, but I need money so bad. Let me just write. <laughs> and I just started taking pictures with you too. Cause I was mm -hmm. like, if you have a job, I will do it. I had contractors at my house I was paying by doing work for them. I was like in crawl spaces, doing dump runs. Like if there was a job to be done, I was there. And so that's kind of how we got started together. Yeah. We were really piecemealing this whole thing together. We were hacking it together every step of the way. And then like you said, Google Images comes along and now when people search for pictures of lions, Google served up my pictures of lions, but without taking them to my website or without me making a penny. Yeah, so people <laughs> they just, just stole completely them. killed that stream of revenue. But we thought, well, what about stock photography? That's kind of the same thing. We'll take pictures and then hope that people use them. And we got into stock photography, and uh, we had some success with that. Our pictures ended up on book covers, on magazine covers, CD covers, uh, billboards. We would just, I remember I was in Target, and suddenly there we were. We, I was in Target and I looked over at the magazine rack and there you were doing a yoga pose. <laughs> but we were making money at it too. Like we, for each individual photo shoot, we would make a couple of grand and we thought, okay, this is a decent way to make some money. I got bullied for that magazine cover. Well, you don't know how to do yoga, so no. I can kind of understand that. I first I got bullied by you because you were like, that's not, I was, did this, which that's a stretch, but you were like, that's not a thing. But then, uh, I ended up on the cover of Yoga Magazine, which I guess is like a legitimate magazine, and you went to Target, and I was in between like Jennifer Aniston and like some other magazine cover, and people were like mad. Like I remember people were like, who the heck do you think you are? You're not a model. I was like, I think I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was the next way we figured out how to actually make money doing what we loved, which was taking pictures. <laughs> yeah. And stock photography started to kind of dry up as every photographer started doing stock photography and everything they started paying less and less and less like down to the point where you'd get like a penny for each picture you sold yeah and we thought we we combine our experience in education and write this book stunning digital photography and going along with the idea of mixing video with my experience writing books we decided it would be a book and i think our first target was like 90 minutes of video that we wanted in it and we recorded all these like little five minute videos and mixed them throughout the book to sort of highlight lessons that we thought were particularly challenging to convey simply in writing since photography is such like a visual thing. Yeah, and we, our first studio was not actually a studio, it was the garage. So we'd clear the cars out of the garage, set up a backdrop, we'd put on one of those propane heaters that contractors use because the garage was freezing cold, so we'd have to run yeah, that. We're in the, Connecticut. We're in Connecticut, it was cold. And then we would do our photos, which I think some of them, no, maybe we removed them from the book when we did an update, but we had them in the book for a while. Some of them are still for sale as stock photography, which is like, they're embarrassingly bad, they're cringe. But it, you don't need a big fancy studio to get started, right? You just need like one room or a garage or even outside, you can make it happen. Yeah, we just had time and energy and we pursued all these random different things, some of which worked for a while and then eventually fizzled out 
and that's okay. You got to constantly be moving on to the next thing. We had so many failures. Actually, we had far more failures than successes. It's just that you don't you don't think about those as much. I'm sure some people do, but most people don't. Um, and also, we didn't know how to do a lot of things. We learned it on the way. So you had experience with writing, but you had always had editors. You had ho always had people handling the book layout, the marketing. And so while Tony was writing, I went to college and I took classes on InDesign, Photoshop, Lightroom, uh, marketing, entrepreneurship, business management, and tried to basically do all the things that you didn't have to worry about while you were doing most of the writing. Yeah, I was mostly just the author and you were the publishing company. You be, you literally founded this company called Mason Press. Also by also accidentally because at the time self-publishing was really looked down upon. So Tony, you had written for like Macmillan, Penguin, big publishing companies and he decided to go off and, and publish on his own because of Amazon doing that at the time. And um, I reached out to Barnes and Noble to try to get her book in there and they were like, we don't take vanity press. You have to have a distributor and you have to be a publishing company. And so I said, Tony, I have to make us a publishing company so that Barnes and Noble will buy books from us. Um, yeah, I reached out to several publishers to try to publish this idea we had for a photography book with the mixed video and they all said no. Yeah. And that's when we decided, well, we better just do it on our own. Which, yeah. thank goodness we did, because publishers will take like 85% of the money. The author actually gets like a tiny amount. And we never would have been able to make a living at it if we hadn't decided to take everything on, publishing and writing. Oh my God, our story is so big. Am I making you bored? Because this is a lot of information to like try to whittle down to a podcast. Yeah, well it is 15 years, but I think people are interested in our background and how we ended up here. Yeah. We started, we were, this is before the term influencer even existed before there were youtubers now everybody on youtube they grew up watching youtube and they want to become a youtuber it is now like a career path but it did not exist at the time okay so a popular video when you first posted your videos on youtube was charlie bit my finger <laughs> great video by the way yeah. it's the two babies the brothers he bites his finger and he's like oh charlie bit my finger it hurts and it's still hurting it was just viral stuff like that and so this concept of being an influencer didn't exist. So we were just, like everything else we told you about, we were just winging it, doing our best. Yeah, and we had recorded a bunch of videos for the book, Stunning Digital Photography. And I was hosting them on like Amazon where I had to pay for everybody who viewed them. And I realized I couldn't sell the book at a reasonable price and have people streaming these videos and paying for them. So YouTube would do it for free. And we thought, oh, why not put them up there uh, publicly available? and see if maybe it makes somebody buy a book. Turned out it did. <laughs> we put a bunch up and then kind of forgot about YouTube for a while and looked back and videos had like 20,000 views. And that was just like a massive number coming from the publishing industry where I could write an educational book and if it sold 10,000 copies in the course of its lifetime, that would be a success story. So we accidentally stumbled upon influencer marketing because we had no marketing budget. So we had a book, we had no sway in the publishing industry. We had no way to market the book. We had no inroads with bookstores, like even local bookstores would not take us. Um, one bookstore in Mystic, she got really mad that we were on Amazon and she was like, refused to carry our book. So we had no marketing. And then when we discovered people could watch our stuff for free on YouTube and we could put a plug for the book in there, we were like, this is it. Our, we don't have a marketing budget, but we have energy and we have time. So let's just give away free stuff and ask people to buy the book. And the most amazing thing is when you're doing that kind of organic marketing, all of you supporting us, you saw that we were just this small husband-wife team and you were amazing at spreading the word through word of mouth. I remember people contacting us and saying, hey, I'm wishing you guys so much luck. You're doing a great job. I tell everyone I meet about your book and your YouTube channel, like good luck and us just like being psyched and be like, they told everyone they know, like it's happening, you know? And so a couple of book sales would turn into hundreds and it was just the whole time, every single day, our minds were being blown. Do you remember just refreshing at our computers and being like, we got a subscriber, we got <laughs> views, someone bought our book. It was like- yeah, the first SVP book review, I still remember it like, holy, oh my God, somebody read the book, somebody I don't know read the book. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was super exciting. Um, 
And I think that that excitement made up for the fact that we were working just nonstop. Just yeah, I, I think if I said 80 hours a week, that would be an underestimation because we, the other 40 hours of waking time, we were thinking about it and talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> that over was all we did. Breakfast would be like, what should we do next? Every single spare moment of time we had, we were working on the book or our Facebook group for the book or the YouTube channel or trying to figure out, do you remember trying to figure out like just basic business management stuff? Like we had to like get a bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. I was trying to do that. That's only funny if you know me. Like I'm not a person with details. So we were trying to learn everything. And logistics like, okay, we got a pallet of books and then I realized we're going to need a pallet jack. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't know how to use a pallet jack, but now we had to figure this out. We had to figure out how to ship thousands and thousands of books around the world. Like all the stuff we had to do while trying to be YouTubers, YouTubers a term that did not exist. And like but luckily we didn't have that pressure like social media now everyone tries to have a Lamborghini like we didn't even know better we just were out there like trying to just make it work with no idea that things could get big or that we could be YouTubers or influencers so let's talk about some of our biggest milestones because there were definitely moments where we were failing we faced a lot of rejection like I told you Barnes and Noble turned us away the first distributor we tried to get Baker and Taylor turned us away uh, we had videos that did not work out. We put a lot of time into them and nobody really cared or people didn't like them. But then there were moments where we said, like, this is absolutely working. Um, one of the milestones was 10,000 subs. You s yeah, you noticed the big numbers, right? You noticed 10,000? Well, first 1,000. Right. Then I remember 2,500. Then it's like 5,000, 10,000. Yeah, and every time you like celebrate and you go out to dinner and you're like, oh my God, that's such an unfathomable number. Can you imagine 10,000 people <laughs> watching us? We used us? to like Google what stadiums held how many people and then we'd look at the stadium and be like, that whole stadium of people saw our video. We'd be so excited. <laughs> and um, we would monitor the book sales on Amazon too because Amazon will like rank the digital photography mm -hmm. books and it kept like climbing up and climbing up and yeah. then one day we were actually number one on digital photography books on Amazon and we were so excited about that yeah nowadays we don't even try to send people to Amazon like we want them to buy <laughs> directly yeah. from our store Amazon has changed a lot everything has changed as we've done this too like um, YouTube is more full of ads now which I'm sure you've noticed and Amazon now you can pay to be the top search result at the time, it was like search optimization, which is why our book name is Stunning Digital Photography. It seems silly now. It's almost like AAA plumbing for the, for the yellow pages, right? <laughs> like you just wanted this optimization. That was just for search optimization. And it worked at the time, and it's like dated now, but uh, that worked for us. But yeah, things have definitely changed. Um, another big milestone for me is I remember we were out and about some local town, and somebody said, hey, I think, where do I know you guys from? And they recognize us from the YouTube channel. And oh I was my. like, oh my God, the, there's like real people on the other side. Am I famous? <laughs> it was very flattering. <laughs> it, it's just kind of like mind blowing. It you know was what mind I mean? blowing. I, I will say like people would recognize us and in the moment it would seem real. And then even still to this day, I get in front of the camera and I cannot fathom that anyone will watch this. I don't know what's wrong with my brain where I keep doing that. Um, what about... I remember our first print run, all of our books were digital, and I still remember exactly where we were in our daily walk with our dogs when you convinced me to let go of like my life savings to buy our first print run, and I cried the whole time. And you were like, either you do it or we have to take out a loan and there's gonna be interest. And I was just like, I'll do it, but I've saved for so long. Yeah, I remember, <laughs> I think we wanted uh, 5,000 books at five bucks each yeah. for the color books. And that was $25,000. And then we it got was, all those books and we had to try to sell them. <laughs> it was everything in my, it was like everything. And I was just like, I'm going all in. This is insane, but I'll do it. I just cried the whole walk. I was like, I'm going to do it. Yeah, we just had a big pallet in the garage. <laughs> we were trying to figure out how to ship them. And that super nice guy showed up with the pallet and he was like, you're really nice folks. I hope to see you again. And then we see him every time he delivers the books to our house. He's like, I'm so happy to see you all again. <laughs> He's so sweet to us. I still remember the first time we got coverage in the blogs that I read. Yeah. F-Stoppers and Petapixel were the big blogs. And then at some point they covered one of our videos. And I was like, oh my, 
uh, whoa, am I famous? That's us. <laughs> so flattering. And we'd like read it. We'd read what they wrote because they always just do a summary on your video. And so they just write what your video says. And it'd be like, Tony Northrup explains how blah, blah, blah. And we'd be like, wow, that's us. We'd look at the writer's name. Oh my gosh, he wrote about us. And then we'd look at the comments and be like, ow. <laughs> ow. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the beginning, people are pretty overwhelmingly positive on yeah. YouTube. You hit that critical mass, which might be 30,000 subscribers, where you actually start to develop haters, as well as people who love you. I think it's more subscribers now. You have to be bigger before you get the haters? Yeah, and I see this, and sometimes I think about warning people, because like in the beginning, when you're the underdog, you get so much support where people are like rooting for you, and then you hit this... I don't even know what this invisible line is where suddenly everybody feels like they have to like put you in your place, but you're not different. Like I've never felt yeah. different. So I'm like, why do you hate me now? I'm exactly the same. And sometimes I see YouTubers getting like feeling like they're unstoppable and I just want to be like, if they build you up, they're going to tear you down. It's just the game. Get ready. Get in line. They're going to mm -hmm. find something to hate you for and it's not going to make any sense or even be true. And that, that takes out so many would-be successful YouTubers. They yeah. get to that point when they start to develop haters and then they fall apart. Yeah. It, it's difficult for everybody, but somehow we were mostly bulletproof. Well, you make really good margaritas. Yeah, <laughs> self-medication <laughs> really helps. <laughs> and then um, I think another really huge moment was the first press event we ever went to. It was in Miami with Sony. Um, what camera was that? The A7? A6300, Oh, A6300, right. Yeah. And like... I was so intimidated. I was actually scared out of my mind. We showed up and it was all writers from like Pop Photo. Yeah, but magazines I'd been reading since I was 20. <laughs> like real magazine people, like I'm so dyslexic, so I'm like, these people can spell, Tony. And I was so intimidated and really scared. And there were some people looking at us like, it was us and Chris and Jordan, we were the only YouTube channels there. And I remember pe like some people were like, who the heck do they think they are, these like YouTubers? Like YouTubers was like a four letter word. And then there were some people that were really cool and they were just like, I like what you do, like this is so fun. Uh -huh. um, and that was just a terrifying experience and really fun. And there they had their own career arc that we saw because I remember we were on some press event and it was popular photography finally permanently shut down. Yeah. And we had a popular photography rep on the press event when that news broke, and that's how he found out about it, that yeah. he was suddenly out of a job. I think that that was a moment when I realized that every single career is temporary, and I can remember feeling bad for that person and thinking, that will be me one day, and mm -hmm. how will I handle this with grace, and how will I watch the next generation come up behind me and not be a bitter person, and not be a person that takes it personally, like, I, I remember sitting in that moment really like being like, okay, this will be all of us. Like nobody is on top forever. And that's something I've really thought about. Yeah, you save up some money to help you transition to whatever the next thing is. Yeah. And you try to remain flexible. You try to adapt. You try to acknowledge when things are changing and not fight it too hard, but sort of go with the flow while maintaining your values and stuff. We are going to talk about lessons we've learned in all of this. Yes. Hinting at some of Hopefully that. it's not just us blabbing about ourselves, but we can teach you some things that we learned. And then I think the other big milestone, oh, we talked about that, Squarespace. Um, I think another big key to our success, my dog is scratching my chair. Are you done? No, she's got her teeth like locked around the bottom of it. I think you could lay down now. You need to rest being really crazy like when you were a puppy. Remember when she was a puppy and she interrupted every single podcast? Well, I know. Not much has changed. You need to lay down and be a good girl. Go ahead. Um, and then w one last thing I'll mention before we get to the second part, what we learned, is that we had our live show news, booze, and reviews. Yes, we started a Facebook group to go along with Stunning Digital Photography. It was a Stunning Digital Photography readers group and we used to review everybody's photo, every single photo that was posted, because we could keep up with it at the time. Yeah. And we decided, oh, it would be more effective if we recorded us looking at everybody's pictures and commenting on it. And we would do that every week. And then I thought, okay, there was some new camera launch this week. I want to talk about it. And we mixed that in. 
and then we also had a glass of wine or a margarita. Because it was like Thursday at like 5 o'clock, so we were just beat from the end of the week and the end of the day. Yeah, and we called the show News, Booze, and Reviews. <laughs> and Very we did cool. it every week. And then when YouTube started doing live streaming, I'm such a nerd, I was like excited about this. And I figured out how to hook it up. And we were like the f one of the very first channels on YouTube period to do like a proper multi-camera switched live stream show. I know, I didn't realize it was a big deal until we had some people from like the news or people who had properly done broadcasting professionally come to our studio and be like, what the hell you guys, you have an actual live studio in your basement. And yeah. I was like, is that a big deal? So, yeah. yeah. The cameramen on news shows would be asking us like, how do you do that anyway? <laughs> like, where are your studios? Like, there's just this room in our basement. It's in our basement. That's where we are now. Um, yeah, that was exciting. And that went on for years and we got it sponsored and um, but then YouTube sort of changed how it worked. For the longest time, you went to YouTube and you would see your list of subscribers. And whatever newest videos came from your subscribers, that's what you were probably going to watch. YouTube changed it so they were just suggesting the videos that they thought you should watch. Yeah. And if they suggested a video and people decided not to watch it, then YouTube would stop recommending your channel to them. Uh, and that's what started happening with our live show. We had this like loyal following who wanted to watch every episode but most of our audience didn't want to watch it and as a result having that live show there that most people skip past was actually hurting YouTube hurting our YouTube channel from the perspective of the algorithm yeah and we wanted to keep it going but if we did it was killing the entire channel and so that's why eventually we decided we just had no choice but to end it and we split off the news segments and now I do breaking news. Breaking news. And, and I, we drink on our own time now, not on camera. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was tough because we had people that we really care about, like Kyle and Lewis really reached out to us and told us how important that was to their growth. And I do miss the live show a lot. I miss that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Yeah. But it was actually also very stressful. The, a lot of things go wrong when you're live. And so... I miss it, but I, I'm also glad it's over. So it's another chapter behind us that keeps happening. Every time we come out with something and it's successful, it ends eventually. And you have to just move on to the next thing. And that's breaking news. And then one day, maybe people will be tired of your breaking news. And we'll have to think of another format. But you have to just keep moving. Mm -hmm. All right. So coming up next, we're going to talk about the lessons we've learned, You know, things that we think made us successful our mistakes that we've made. Hopefully we can impart some wisdom onto you if you're thinking about having a business or doing social media, maybe we can help you out. But first, a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. We both have Squarespaces. We talked about that first message I got from Ilias in 2008, and the first thing that we did is we got a free Squarespace and tried it to see if we liked it because we didn't want to push something that we didn't like. I had spent many years in web hosting. That was yeah. my specialty. So when a web hosting provider reached out to me, I was like, okay, well, these guys are going to have to be really good or there's no way I can endorse them because I am a nerd. Well, I have a different background. I had been trying to finish a WordPress portfolio for like two years and never finished because my ADD is so severe. I kept getting frustrated. <laughs> and so Ilya sent us this free trial for Squarespace and I finished mine in like 20 minutes. And I thought, and it looked way better than my other one and also we had been reviewing people's portfolios and they were horribly designed like yeah. fake wood backgrounds music like the little guy with the shovel from like 2005 <laughs> so it actually changed the portfolios we were seeing on our review show because people were getting squarespace and suddenly all the portfolios were looking professional absolutely and so this is a sponsor i'm really proud to have and our, we both have Squarespace. I bought a Squarespace for my mom. You bought like three squ more Squarespaces for yourself. Yeah. And we think that you'd really love it. So give it a try. Put your photos on there. Uh, advertise your business on there. A personal project, a hobby or something? Yeah. Make a website for it. Make it permanent. Give it its own spot on the web. Get your own private domain. Yeah. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. And if you love it, Use the coupon code CHELSEA to get 10% off your permanent subscription. You're going to love it. you got to get rid of that fake wood background. <laughs> <laughs> I do miss the little guy digging, though. Uh, I miss him. We can bring him back. Let's talk about the lessons that we've learned in our 10, 15 years on YouTube so that you don't have to learn it the hard way. Oh, 
this one, the first one, enjoy the journey. You are absolutely correct. You added that slide, but you're so right. We talked about in the beginning working 80 plus hours a week, which is definitely an underestimation. We loved every minute of it. We were obsessed with what we were doing. That's all we thought about. And even though we didn't have enough money at that point and we were taking all sorts of side gigs, we were really passionate about what we were doing. So uh, we enjoyed it, even though it was challenging all the time. When you get old people telling you to do something you're passionate about, it seems like this some BS fortune cookie nonsense. Yeah. But it's actually real because you are only going to be able to put that 100 hours a week into something that you're excited about. You can't fake that. So if you're not that excited about it, don't do it because you're not going to be successful in this highly competitive world. There's lots of people who want to do it. You need to be a little bit more passionate than them. I will say I don't think we could have made it this far if we didn't have that energy but I don't think we could have ever sustained that energy. It's like a marathon, not a sprint. So we were definitely sprinting at first and then you have to sustain some amount. Yeah, but you put the afterburners on until you get up to a cruising altitude, right? And yeah. You gotta keep the engines on, but you can relax a little bit. Yeah, I'm definitely more relaxed now than when we started. We had no work personal life balance at all. It yeah. was just all work. And now we actually, we do other things that we don't talk about publicly. <laughs> that sounds really dirty. <laughs> okay, so another thing is remain flexible and adapt to viewers, the algorithm, trends, just the passing of time in general. I've seen so many people dig their heels in about just trends that are here to stay. YouTube was one of them. We were ridiculed for being on YouTube because it was stupid. Yeah, especially coming as a published author. Yeah, and self-publishing on Amazon was one of them. That was something that was deemed to be stupid and new and reckless and never going to stick around. So now when I see something like TikTok pop up, I don't make fun of it. New things come along. They can displace you. Keep an open mind. Don't be bitter about change. Don't be bitter about the newer, younger people coming along. Just remain open to it and, and be ready to shift. Try something new. Here's an example. We've seen uh, YouTube has changed its algorithms and there was a time when simply saying portrait photography tutorial was the way to go. Yeah. That would work out great. But now, now clickbait really rules. Yeah. Each thumbnail and each title have to really get people's attention. And that didn't feel good to me at first. I like I I'm a very factual person. Yeah. But our YouTube channel was going to go away and then we wouldn't be able to make a living and we'd have to go do something else and we wouldn't be able to do this. So we just had to adapt. We had to remain flexible even though that's not my favorite way to do things. That was how we continue to bring content to people. I call it the zucchini fries method. When you want your kid to eat vegetables and they won't, do you just fight with them or do you, you know, coat them in some breadcrumbs and make it look like french fries? Like you have to be creative. And you know what? We really took crap for that too. People at precedence called us out, called us clickbait, made fun of us. Like really, we got pushback. And then, you know, three years later, I see them doing the same thing. So just. You know, you don't have to let your ego get in the way. Just do what you have to do to get the job done. Yeah, but at the same time, maintain your value system. Like, yeah, decide you... what your values are. And is being a little bit dramatic or a little bit sensationalistic against my values? It's not against my values. It was taking money for a review and saying something's great and not, you know, disclosing that or that, that would is be against, against my our values. values. Yeah. So I don't feel good about that. Um. Another tip is to be consistent, have deadlines, and focus on good enough. And this is a great one because in the beginning I was a perfectionist, which sounds like a compliment to myself, but it's not. It was debilitating. I couldn't get anything done because nothing that I was doing was good enough, and I'd get caught up on the same project and never finish it. And it was you, Tony, who would just be like, just put it out. You're done. It's fine. The next one will be better. You need to move on. And that was a really tough lesson for me to learn. Um, and also, I had to learn how to have deadlines for myself, which a lot of people are working from home now. You probably know what that's like. I put an hour tracking app in my phone like I was a contractor for myself. And I tracked my hours every single day for every single task to make sure I was staying on task. And that was something I had to do to make sure I was putting in the hours effectively. What, and one nice thing about sponsors, especially having monthly or weekly sponsors, is they make you get the video out on mm -hmm. a particular time, and that definitely continues to drive our schedule. It's actually good for us. It's like we have a boss. It's like we have a boss. I actually put that in my ADHD video that nobody watched, <laughs> that I have to have sponsors for my videos because I need outside accountability. That's a problem that I have. That's why all of my videos are sponsored. It makes me put them out. One of the continued complaints about our channel is that we 
are plugging our book too much, we're plugging our sponsors too much. Realistically, you either make money on it and realistically you figure out how to monetize what you're doing or you don't do it full time. Yeah. If you want to be really good at something, you have to figure out how to pay your bills unless you're just independently wealthy, which we're not. But it's also important to diversify that revenue stream because one revenue stream can disappear really, really fast. And that's a lesson we learned from your stock site. When Google right. came along and you know decided to do Google Images, $40,000 a year disappeared almost overnight. Yeah, it went to a few hundred dollars a year. Yeah. And if I'd been surviving based solely on that, I don't know what I would have done. So you have to think of all the different ways you can make money. What we do is we have our books and our videos, which are on our own store. We also have our stuff on Amazon so people can find it there. We have sponsors for all of our videos, and then we have revenue from YouTube itself. Um, and then sometimes we take outside jobs. So we did a job for Google where we made some training materials for them. We like to keep a diverse revenue stream because we know that any one of these things can disappear at any time. And so we know we have to stay flexible. And, our, and they have. We've had several of them dry up. Like stock photography went away for us pretty much. Yeah. Um, your site went away. We had some, a few other things that just stopped working for us. And luckily we had somewhere else to put our energy. And that leads me to the next point, which is success is always finite. You know, my dad had pretty much the same job from the time he joined the Air Force when he was 18 to when he retired at like 67. Pretty much the same title, but that's not going to be the case for me and that's not going to be the case for almost every young person. You're going to end up hopping from one thing to the next. And uh, I've learned that in a very painful process, you know, from joining BBN and doing web hosting from like 1997 until 2004 when the entire industry just completely collapsed and the company I had a million dollars in stock options for just went completely bankrupt. Yeah. And I realized like, I can be on the biggest, most exciting bandwagon and it can disappear in a year and leave me broke. So I'm always kind of thinking and looking ahead and preparing for that next thing, but also um, putting my fingers out and seeing how these different things might work and sort of hedging my bet. For me, it's a matter of always acknowledging that it is finite and it is temporary and that I have to plan for a future. So financially, you're going to ask Tony, I'm always stressing about how Tony and Chelsea are going to live in 10 years because I want to make sure that I've prepared so that when this goes away, we have enough revenue to shift and start a different business or do something else. Knock on wood, I hope we don't have to do that. It's been 15 years. Maybe we can ride it out a couple more, but... This is longer than I expected. I thought YouTube would have like a five-year lifespan. Like, yeah. MySpace is gone, right? Nobody even goes to like Instagram or Facebook anymore. Now it's all about... You know, Snapchat's dead, now it's TikTok, and how long is that going to be around? YouTube actually lasting a long, long time. Well, but the thing is, your lifespan on YouTube can be short, because I've seen people, I've seen their popularity explode because the algorithm favors them for some reason nobody understands, mm -hmm. and then also disappear just as quickly. And I feel for those people because it must you must feel so out of control when you don't know what happened to you. Um, and that could happen for some reason. YouTube could decide to never show our videos to you again, and that would be devastating, and we just have to hope it doesn't happen, but I have zero control over that. And you're being brutally honest with people, but I also want to make the point that you have to take some risks. You cannot fear failure. You have to expect failure and go into it anyway. And just because an endeavor fails doesn't mean you as a person have failed. Yeah. You should be planning to fail on 10 different things before you find one that's successful. That's been my own personal life experience. And in the course of this, we've talked about so many of our efforts that went nowhere, that just completely failed, but we learned something from each one of them. They all become part of our story, even though it ultimately didn't end up being the career that took us through to retirement. Yeah. I also think that like, if you're not taking a risk, you can't ever stand to have some kind of reward. Like You have to do the scary things, like me putting all of my life savings into our first book run. Um, you just kind of have to do it at some point. You have to be a little bit crazy to do something like this. And also, like another reason, if you want to be on YouTube, you definitely can't be afraid because if you have any success, any mistake that you have, there will be someone out there 
using it against you and you really have to be ready for that like when you leak the a7 IV from Sony mm -hmm. people made videos making fun of you that was actually like a moment where we were so upset about that and then having people making fun of us it was like it was very very upsetting and then you just have to move on and you have to put yourself out there again and you have to know there will always be someone there to put a magnifying glass over your failures and just move on it's gonna be fine you're gonna make it through right yeah uh, on the flip side, you're going to see other people who spring past you, yeah. who are more successful than you. It happens to everyone because the world is constantly changing. Trends are constantly changing. Who you are might have been trendy for a couple of years, but then people like a different personality type, yeah. and you are left in the dust. You, you can't resent these people who are yeah. suddenly wildly successful. That is great. You should applaud their success, and if anything, try to learn a little bit from them. And maybe you can apply that to what you're doing and adapt yourself, like we talked about earlier. I do th find that when I see people being bitter about the new, bright, shiny star, they do this thing where they think that they're mad at the other person, but by being mad at them, they're closing themselves down to learning from that person. So let's say someone shoots up and they're successful, I'll always see someone be like, well, they just got lucky or they're kind of like dismissive of their success or their intelligence and that really is limiting the person from learning about why they're successful. So if you get that little twinge of jealousy in your stomach where you want to make an excuse for why the person's not good or they're just lucky, hold on to it. Ask yourself why you're jealous. Why am I jealous? What do I want that they have? And then learn from that feeling. But you got to let it go. You can't hate people because they're, they're succeeding. Right? Don't be a hater. Speaking of not hating, don't hate on Squarespace because they are the best web hosting service, hands down. They made this entire podcast happen and they actually made me finish my website for the first time ever in my life. So thank you. If you want your very own Squarespace website, go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. And thanks to everybody for following and supporting our channel for the past decade. It's been an incredible 10 years. I can't believe we're able to do what we love for a living. It's all because of you. Thank you so much. It really much. is. Thank you so much. We did it.